Great. Uh, so thank you all so much for, for coming to meet with me today, especially on the lead in to a, a holiday weekend. I appreciate uh, you all making the time to be here with me. Um, I see a nice blend of uh, names I recognize from the E-Rate program, as well as some new names. I assume you guys are uh, perhaps outreach librarians or, or frontline library staff or those who work with for that staff. So I'm really going to try to make this presentation as applicable as possible to both of this group of, of library professionals. Um, if you'll allow me to introduce myself. My name is Emily Hart. I am the E-Rate and Director Connections Consultant with the Bureau of Library Development here as part of the State Library in Tallahassee. I have been in this position, serving in this capacity for just shy of five years now, mainly working with the federal E-Rate program. This benefit that I have brought you guys here to speak about today is more focused on a consumer program, but the two do parallel and overlap a little bit. So that's why I'll be the one who's, who's laying it out for you. I again want to be clear, what I'm talking about is paralleled, but it is not the same program, nor it is, is it the same funding source. Uh, E-Rate is a program that was begun uh, in the 90s as part of the then soaring cost of internet connectivity for educational institutions of which libraries are also counted um, in response to the, at that point, need for dial-up uh, connectivity. Um, as I'm going through this day, I should have stated at the outset, I absolutely welcome questions. So if you have any questions about anything I'm talking about, go ahead and put them into the chat or raise your hand. And um, one of my continuing education uh, colleagues will relay them to me. I'm sorry. Uh, so just to go back to it, if you've ever looked down at your cell phone bill or your cable bill uh, and you've noticed that there's a collection of fees at the bottom that are related to the universal service fee and you've been curious about where that goes, that is for the E-rate program. Perhaps you're not curious and you just write that all down as, you know, the Fed's taking their cut. Um, these fees add up to about $4 billion annually, and they all go into a pot of funding that is administered by the Universal Service Administrative Company, or USAC, under the FCC. Uh, USAC has also been designated in this particular case as the same institution that will be administering the emergency broadband benefit for consumers. So that is where my, uh, my experience working with USAC will hopefully come in handy uh, in terms of helping you guys uh, put your patrons in touch with this emergency funding. I wanted to talk to you guys as providers of information, library staff, and especially frontline front librarians, um, whether that's reference and circulation staff or teen or youth librarians or outreach personnel. You guys are the people who are closest to the patrons in your community. And often you know perhaps more that, so than uh, administrators or uh, other outreach or service organizations in your community. You often know where the greatest needs are. Your patrons, many of whom you may work with, every day are used to working with you or your staff on incredibly personal documents, whether it's tax information, social security, SNAP, or child welfare applications, or really anything else. We know that a recent Pew study showed that almost 80% of surveyed Americans ranked their library at the very top of the trusted profession index. And just looking at our own studies here with the Bureau, we showed that 18 million reference transactions took place in a single year, which was 2019 is the last year that we have data on that for, but still, we can only assume that that number is going to continue to increase from year to year, which means that we knew that there was such a great overlap between libraries who are already kind of used to working in information professionalism and also connectivity and trust. So that's why I'm so glad that I see no names that I haven't really worked with before uh, who have registered and, and are here with us today uh, because it shows that um, you guys recognize or are interested in helping this incredibly uh, high need group of people. The program that I am discussing today is not strictly speaking for libraries, but knowing that the unique role that your library, uh, your library staff play in the lives of your patrons, I really feel 
felt that it was important that correct information is being brought to you. Uh, if you have patrons who you know use the library because they don't have the resources to afford high-speed internet at home, or if another patron comes in with a question because it's been brought to them by, say, a service provider, um, it's been brought to their attention and they don't know if it's trustworthy or not, this is really an opportunity to, to reach these patrons who do regard you, uh, the library profession as a good source of both connectivity and trusted information. So, what is the emergency broadband benefit, uh, which I'll also be referring to throughout this as EBB. And I wanna reiterate that you can absolutely ask questions at any time. So if you feel like I'm losing the plot, please put your hand up. So the emergency broadband benefit was passed as part of a massive COVID relief package in the spring of 2021. One part of that overall relief path passage um, was this $3.2 billion designated for the emergency broadband benefit. Um, they took the existing institution of the Universal Service Administrative Company, or USAC, under the FCC and determined that they would, were best suited to be administering this uh, relief program. These funds will be available to consumers until the money has been spoken for or up to six months following the end of the pandemic, um, which they have decided will be ended when it is declared to, uh, to be over by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, as of right now, uh, as of today, the last time that office renewed their declaration was April 15th in 2021, and they review and determine whether or not to extend it about every three months. So if this is news to you, don't worry, you're not alone. I couldn't even have named the U U.S. Secretary of Health and U Human Services six months ago. So this particular fund will be available for up to six months following the end of the national health emergency um, determined by Xavier Becerra, by the way, uh, who is the current Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, so currently, if they did not renew it again uh, after this April 15th time where they put out the last declaration, it will end July 27th and then it would be determined to be over. Uh, the, the fund would end six months after that July 27th date. So what is the emergency broadband benefit for? It, it goes to fund one monthly benefit uh, for one device per eligible household. Sorry, and one device per eligible household. $50 a month discount for broadband services or rental of any type of associated equipment, whether that's modems, routers, um, anything that is used to get the internet into an eligible household. Uh, that number actually is increased to $75 a month for households that are on tribal lands. I do not know if we have any tribal librarians with us today, but they have designated that they recognize that this uh, national health emergency has disproportionately affected those on tribal lands. So there is a, an increase in the benefit being related per month for those who live on tribal lands. There is also a one-time discount of up to $100 for whether a laptop, tablet, or desktop computers, um, which when purchased through eligible providers. Uh, again, these discounts are one-time only and are provided, you know, uh, for purchase of those devices. This fund can also be used uh, if the household has a past due balance or balances in collections. So if you have patrons who are coming in and using the library uh, who may uh, confide that they, they're interested or that they know that there's need, but that they can't, they don't feel that it's, they're able to access it because they're, they have a past due balance or the collections agencies are after them, they can still apply uh, and still qualify for this benefit. It also applies if households receive internet services, say provided by a property management company, uh, basically if they rent, if it's, and their internet connectivity is provided sort of as part of their rent um, by their landlord or property manager. Do we have any questions so far? All right, hearing none. 
pretty clear cut so far, right? So having spoken a little bit about what the funding isn't is for, I'll talk a little bit more about what the funding isn't for. It is not uh, available to support more than one device per household. Um, that's really for the you know the what the one hundred dollar discount. Uh, there there is no limit as far as I know <laughs> to how many devices can can be uh, used on a household that's receiving that fifty dollar per month discount. It is not is also not apply to every service provider, although there are quite a number of service providers, especially here in Florida, who are participating. Um, you cannot just assume that because someone is in an area providing internet services that they will uh, be working with the emergency broadband benefit or offering it to their, their customers. It also does not support mobile phones or types of mobile phone services. Um, I personally know that I have read the study that says that uh, about a third of American households are using smartphones to access the internet. So I, you know, personally think that that's a little short-sighted, but um, at this time, the emergency broadband benefit is not going to cover mobile phone or mobile phone services. And as I mentioned previously, this will not be uh, available indefinitely. There is a, an end period, either when the money runs out or when the, the program is ended um, due to the end of the, the official um, time of emergency <laughs> due to the health crisis. It also cannot be applied to a household, like just blanket without the household's consent. Um, so just so if people are coming in and they have questions about it and they said, well, I think my landlord might also be applying, that actually is is kind of a, a red flag um, because households do have to sign up and sign off on it. Um, nor is it applied automatically. They're not just looking at blanket, at everybody who qualifies and applying it off the top it does have to be applied for, and um, they will have, have some knowledge that they are participating. All right, now I've spoken a little bit about who is eligible, and I'll kind of go into that a little bit more. Uh, if any member of a household, and they define household as, as a group of people living, you know, under one roof um, and sharing, um, you know, a common income, um, there really can only, there can be more than one household at a single residence, um, but they, they do get it into it a little bit more, more finely than that. Uh, there cannot be, you know, multiple people in the same family uh, splitting themselves up as multiple households to receive more discounts. So if any member of the household uh, received a Pell Grant, for those of you who, who may not be aware, Pell Grants are need-based scholarships, usually applied for undergrad degrees. Um, you Generally, people who are applying for them are very aware that they're applying for them because they do have to do the very complicated you know, federal uh, application for financial services, or FAFSA. So if someone in the household received a Pell Grant, uh, in this year, or if someone in the household received free or reduced uh, school lunches at their K through 12 schools, school lunches or breakfasts, either last year or this year. Um, if someone in the household, if the household as a whole has an income uh, at or below 135% of the federal poverty level, um, I honestly have looked into the federal poverty level a little bit in preparation for this and I will say that I can completely understand why they have set it at 135 percent rather than 100 percent. That level is um, slightly punitive I guess in my opinion. Or if someone if the household participates in the SNAP uh, food benefit, Medicaid, or was already participating in the USAC Lifeline program. Again, these are all things that probably someone in the household is very much aware that they are are working in this. There's not going to be a lot of like, are we or are we not participating in these programs? If anyone in the household experienced a loss of income due to job loss or furlough since uh, February 29th, 2020, uh, or basically, you know, March 1st, 2020. Or, and this is key here, uh, 
Different participating service providers have their own sets of eligibility criteria because they may be already have ongoing um, aid programs, um, generally need-based. And so they have allowed for some flexibility for service providers because that is ultimately, you know, kind of a decision that resides with them and service providers are very keenly involved in this sort of consumer-driven program. Do we have any questions? So one of the questions I knew that was going to come up, especially because I knew that there are E-rate people who are interested or listening in today, uh, is SIPA required? For those of you who aren't uh, familiar with it, the Children's Internet Protection Act, or SIPA, has been around since 2000. This is a requirement for LSTA funding as well as E-rate funds for libraries in the normal course of a funding year, uh, schools and libraries, I should state. It's intended to protect minors from exposure to materials that are deemed obscene or harmful. In practical terms, it really requires that schools or libraries that receive federal funds for internet services need to have filtering software in place and keep a log. So now that I've defined it and, and brought it up, is SIPA required for the emergency broadband benefit? And the short answer is no. Because such a major part of SIPA's regulations is that it's intended for schools and libraries to be filtering services provided in-house, uh, and this service is really intended to go, you know, home with consumers and be, in essence, only at in their homes, um, no, SIPA is not required, and there is no requirement currently aware, that I'm aware of that uh, filtering would have to be in place for people to be using the emergency broadband benefit. So how is this discount provided to your patrons who are the consumers? It is essentially going to come via their service provider. The exact mechanism for it is being left up to each provider. Um, so as a state employee, I cannot really recommend or endorse one vendor over another. And I wanted to be sure that by just by listing the most recognizable ones to me, I wasn't effectively endorsing them. So what I'm going to do is direct you to this list that the FCC is managing. Uh, this list, which as of this morning was at, at about 47 providers and counting, is all the providers who have applied to be uh, part of the emergency broadband benefit as approved vendors. You all know your local areas a lot better than I do and will know which ones are active in your neck of the woods. Uh, I should say if a provider is not on this list, it doesn't mean that they won't enroll later, so keep checking back. They do update it fairly regularly. However, if you hear of a provider who's not on the list, uh, who is approaching patrons, uh, making an offer in your community, that might be something to give me pause and possibly be a red flag, uh, especially as we are helping people sort of navigate the dangerous waters of information surety in, uh, in this year. So how do consumers apply? So that URL that's on the screen there right now, getemergencybroadband.org is the portal through which consumers can access the application as well as all sorts of instructions. And I would suggest if this is something that you're interested in bringing to your patrons, that's a really great source of information. They can apply online. They can also send in a paper uh, mail application um, or they can provide through their provider. The instructions are available in about 11 languages, I believe, um, although the application itself is only available in English and Spanish. So I would say that's a little bit of a, a gap that just to be aware of. As people are filling this out, they will need to provide their own contact information, as well as uh, information about the address where services are going to be received. And just to kind of give you some idea of the pieces of information that people may need to collect, um, they they want you to show that you're, and I'm using the, the second person here, but they'll, they'll want consumers to show that they qualify in some way. Um, 
all will have to kind of provide a social security number or a tribal ID number. Uh, they also accept driver's license numbers or military ID, IDs. The most complete list is at that URL at the top of the slide, so I will again direct people there. Um, these are just some of the, the examples I saw. You can prove that your household qualifies in any of these ways, whether it's, you know, Pell Grant approval, SNAP award confirmation, um, a child support decree, um, tax returns or Veterans Administration benefits, um, as well as if you're, for instance, if someone is going uh, under the, the loss of income due to layoff or furlough, uh, some sort of notice of that, as well as uh, an unemployment application or approval. And these, are, these are all ORs. These are not, you have to have all of this. This is a list of some of the different pieces of documentation they list as examples. Each company, as I mentioned, uh, has their own application process and uh, may be requiring different aspects of it. This tool that they've listed, the Companies Near Me tool, is not as granular as I hoped it would be um, or that I hope that it will end up being. Uh, for instance, when I searched for a city or county uh, or by zip code, it really just shows all the entities that are registered in Florida. They do mention that they update this tool often, so keep checking back. But for instance, I know up here in the Panhandle, sometimes we have companies that are registered, for instance, over the state line in Georgia or Alabama um, who also provide services in our area. So that can be, I think, a, maybe perhaps a little confusing and I do hope that they they provide some more information um, or refine it further in the future but again each company has their own application process um, so consumers will need to apply for it uh, either on their own or through their service provider and I can't really be too specific about what each service provider will offer other than I did read that a lot of companies are conducting some form of interview, uh, pr probably over the phone, uh, as part of the intake process. All right, do I have any questions about this benefit or the application process? Emily, uh, I've got a question. Um, so is this something patrons would do on their own or do they need to do it through a library or how? What is the process for a patron to sign up? This is really, really being done at the you know consumer or patron level. But I do know that libraries are frequently involved in some of the um, the applications for different programs, um, perhaps more than they uh, are necessarily prepared to be. So this is really more of an effort um, by bringing it to you guys in libraries that I hope to kind of answer some questions that you might have and maybe provoke a little bit of discussion or if a if you know that this program is out there, um, possibly offer it to your patrons as an offer, as, a, as a, an option. Thank you. All right. As Daryl mentioned at the top of our time together, uh, we will be archiving this presentation today uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, Please share this widely with your reference or outreach staff or whoever you think might work with patrons who are, who are in need or even, you know, beyond your library walls, especially if you work with community aid organizations or others in your community who, uh, are you know, are in positions of trust and uh, bringing information to the, those who are in need in your communities. I would absolutely love it. And I will happily take any questions after the fact. So just some bullet points briefly, if you remember nothing else from me uh, speaking with you today, this is $3.2 billion in funding for households in need. It's a temporary benefit, so this is something that um, as it is now available as of last month for people to begin applying, go ahead and get people uh, aware of it and excited about it if you can. It is unknown at this point when this program will end. For those of you who might be interested in programs for libraries, I actually have an upcoming webinar next week about the E-Rate Connectivity Fund for Schools and Libraries. That will be July 8th from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern. The sign-up link is available right now. 
Uh, just to sort of wet your whistle for it, uh, this is a another federal program for funds that are going to be sent on connectivity uh, for schools and library connected devices from July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022. Tablets, computers, routes, routers, and da -da -da, hotspots are allowable technologies to be applied for under the E-Rate Connectivity Fund. Uh, all devices are available for use off of library and school grounds, although SIPA compliance is still required. And the funding application window for that particular program that I will be outlining next week uh, began actually yesterday, June 29th, and will run through August 13th. So if any of you had questions about that that I didn't answer today, uh, please come back and, and see me next week. And then and if Emily, you, oh, yes. sorry, Natasha asked, um, Will attendees be receiving the slides for this presentation? Yes. If you signed up for this one today, I will absolutely share these slides with you uh, in an email as soon as our the archive link is available to drop into that later today. And if anyone would like some input or uh, to have me, you know, uh, guest with, for instance, any of your staff um, to ask me questions directly, I would be very happy to help you guys out with that. If you want to stay in touch with us here, uh, with me specifically, or with the Bureau at large, uh, the E-Rate mailing list link um, will go out, as well as here's a, a link to the E-Rate webpage where I make a lot of my announcements. Uh, I also send updates to the statewide uh, library listserv, which is listed here. And you can also go straight to the horse's mouth, as it were, and speak to, uh, to go to usac.org, where they put out weekly news briefs. And here is my contact information. If you'd ever like to, to catch up with me or uh, ask me direct questions that I might not have answered for you today or that you think of after the fact. Does anyone have any questions before I, I leave you today? Well, I will say thank you again for, for your attendance today. I'm so excited that we had such a d diverse group of people across all, all the library spectrum joining us. Um, it shows that there's a lot of interest out there and I really hope that we can, uh, if, if there's anything I can do to help you uh, bring information about this to your patrons, please do not hesitate to ask. Uh, I really think that this is an exciting program. It shows that the feds are, are thinking creatively about what the need is. Um, and although it is still developing, I do appreciate that they're bringing it to us uh, sooner rather than later. <laughs> And we got a couple of questions in the chat. Excellent. I love uh, questions. Paul asked, how does a library ensure SIPA for an off-premise device? Um, well, for the emergency broadband benefit, SIPA would not be required. Um, for a an off-premises device that would might be covered under the ECF, which will be the program I'm discussing a little bit more next week, that would be regarding permissions that are set up on the device that is being purchased, you know, before it is loaned out. Okay, and then next question. You mentioned not all documents were needed as proof. Do you know how many or which combo of documents are required of consumers? I do know that they will require some sort of certification of, you know, uh, residents. That, that where it's going to be, as well as you know, proof of identity of whoever's filing um, for this benefit, as well as um, and those. And I can go back to that slide. Um, these are just again uh, sort of examples of, of qualifications. Um, I would recommend going and taking a look at that link there at the top of the slide um, for the more complete list, um, because it does seem that the, the the three things that they're really requiring are residents, identification of the applicant, and then some form of qualification proof. And I really included all of these here just to show you the width and breadth of the different types of things that they're counting as qualification proof. 
some of these I would not have considered or just not are not on my radar personally, but would certainly function as, you know, proof of need. Do we have any other questions or have I covered it for you guys, especially the, those last last two questions? All right, well, hearing nothing else from the audience, I think I um, covered. Can you move it, sorry, can you move sure. it to your um, contact oh, slide, Emily? That way absolutely, can... sorry. No problem. Well, again, if you think of anything, if you're kind of, you know, percolating on it in the next couple of days, or I guess we'll be heading into a holiday here, but uh, if you're thinking about it uh, and you'd like to reach out to me after the fact and, and just ask any more questions, I would be happy to address them. And uh, I hope that I've provided at least a little bit of, of grist for the old thinking mills.